Hello and welcome to Bay College's video lectures for Math 095, Basic Algebra. We're starting out in section 5.4 and 5.5. They're related sections. They both deal with solving linear equations. So in order to solve linear equations, we have to review a couple of things. And the first one is order of operations. Now, we use order of operations to simplify expressions. But we also use it, in a sense, to solve linear equations. Now, to do expressions, we eliminate parentheses. And then we work exponents, multiplication, and division. Not in any particular one first, but we go from left to right. Same thing, addition and subtraction, we go left to right. But when we solve equations, our goal is to undo the math, to get the variable that we're dealing with all by itself. And to do that, we undo the math, so we undo order of operations. We undo any addition or subtraction. We undo any multiplication and division. And essentially, what we do to undo that math is use the properties of equality, something we should be familiar with. If two values are set equal to each other, if I add something to the left side and I add something to the right side, and if we recall what I do to one side, I do to the other, we will have an equivalent equation, which means it'll have the same solutions. Same thing if we do subtraction. What I do to one side, I do to the other. That also applies for multiplication and division. So to solve equations, we're going to move over here. Our goal is to isolate the variable, to get the unknown value all by itself on one side of the equation. And we start by simplifying if possible. If there's something I can do to eliminate parentheses or to maybe combine terms just to get something a little simp more simplified, it'll be a little easier to uh, reach that goal of isolating the variable. The second step is use the properties of equality to make these equal equations or equivalent equations, excuse me. And so that they have the same set of solutions, but we're getting that variable isolated, that goal. And then the last thing you should always do, check your work. Take the value you find, plug it back into the original equation, and make sure that it makes a true statement. All right, let's look at a few examples. The first one here, we have 2x plus 8 equals negative 20. Now, I identify, well, this is my variable. This is what I don't know. There's nothing I can really simplify. There's no parentheses that I need to eliminate or anything like that. So I say, OK, it's time to undo the math. So I'm going to reverse the order of operations. I'm going to undo any addition or subtraction. Well, I see this addition, and my goal is to get this by itself. So I'm going to undo that addition by doing subtraction. And what I do to one side? I do to the other. It's that property of equality. And now I can simplify 2x plus 8 minus 8. Well, 8 minus 8 is 0. 2x and 0 is just 2x. I have negative 20 and negative 8. Well, they have the same sign. So I'm going to combine. And I'm going to get negative 28. Now I see, well, I have 2x equals negative 28. I still have a mathematical operation. This says 2 times x. I can undo multiplication using division. And if I divide a number by itself, it becomes 1. But I have to use that property of equality. What I do to one side, I have to do to the other. And now if I just do that math, 2 over 2 is 1. It reduces to 1x, which is just an x. And here I have negative 28 divided by 2. Well, a negative divided by a positive is negative. 28 divided by 2, or half of 28, is going to give me 14. So I have x equals negative 14. Let's see if that's a true statement. If I take negative 14 and put it in for the variable, and there's only one here, so I only have to put it in one time, 2 times negative 14 would be negative 28. Negative 28 plus 8, different signs, I'm going to find their difference. The difference of negative 28 and 8 would be a negative 20. So this side would equal negative 20. This side is equal to negative 20. It's a true statement. Negative 20 is negative 20. It is what it is. All right, so let's look at this example here. Here we have some parentheses. So maybe I'm going to simplify. I can eliminate parentheses by using the property of distribution, the distributive property. So if I distribute 4 times x, 
and 4 times negative 3. And sometimes I like to draw in arrows so I don't miss any variables. 4 times negative 3 is negative 12. Here I have another set of parentheses. So I'm going to distribute again 4 times x and 4 times negative 1. Well, 4 times x is 4x. And 4 times negative 1 is negative 4. Now, there's some more simplifying I can do. I say, OK, well, I have uh, some terms that are alike on the same side. So 4x's minus 2x's would give me 2x's. And I just bring this value with. So now I have 2x minus 12 equals 4x minus 4. Well, my goal is to isolate the variable. And here it's on both sides of the equation. So I have to get it on one side of the equation. So to do that, a rule of thumb that I use so that I work with positive values, because you know, for students and myself, working with positive values is generally an easier way to go about things. I assess these two values. And I choose the smaller one. I know 2 is less than 4. That's the value that I'm going to move across the equal sign. And essentially move it. Here we have a positive 2x. I want to take it away from this side. And to do that, what I do to one side, I do to the other because of that property of equality. And now if I simplify 2x minus 2x is 0x's minus 12. Well, 0 of anything is 0 minus 12 is minus 12. 4x minus 2x is going to give me 2x. And this value just comes along. So now we've simplified it. And now it's very similar to that problem. So what I can do is I can say, well, I want to undo this subtraction. So I'm going to add 4 to both sides. And even though I'm running out of board space, that's all right. We'll just move up here. So here we have negative 12 and 4, which Different signs, we find their difference. The difference would be 8. The larger value is negative. So it's a negative 8. I'll just write it up here, negative 8 equals, and here, negative 4 plus 4, that goes away. That was my goal. So I have 2x. So negative 8 equals 2x. Now we see the operation of multiplication. We can undo that with division, undo the math. And we see this reduces to 1. And negative 8 divided by 2, while a negative over a positive is negative, 8 divided by 2 is 4. So I get negative 4 equals x. Now, <clears throat> it doesn't matter which side of the equal sign our x is on, because negative 4 equals x is the same thing as saying x equals negative 4. So don't worry about what side you're on. It was nice that we got to work with a positive coefficient for x. And then we would plug this in and check it. Well, negative 4 and negative 3 is negative 7 times 4 is going to give me negative 28. I'll just write it up there. Minus 2 times x, that's another x I have to put in this value for it. Negative 2 times a negative 4 would be a positive 8. And here we have negative 4 minus 1 would be negative 5. Negative 5 times 4 is going to give me negative 20. Is this a true statement? Well, when we check that one, we got a very similar statement. Negative 28 plus 8 is negative 20. That is a true statement. So I know that this is my solution. All right, <clears throat> one more here. Again, we see we have x's on both sides. So I want to start by getting them on one side. And I look at this and assess, well, negative 10 and positive 4, which one is the smaller value? Well, I know negative values are less than positive. So this is a smaller value, even though the number itself looks larger. Because that sign belongs to that number, it's negative 10. So I'm going to add 10 x's to both sides. And by doing that, this goes away. And the only thing over here is 5. And 4x and 10x is 14x minus this 2. And now again, we have something very similar to what we had before. So I can start undoing the math. I'm going to add 2 to both sides to undo this subtraction. And I'm going to get 7 equals 14x. And then I identify this as multiplication, 14 times x. Well, I can undo multiplication with division. And 14 over 14 is 1, so I have just 1x. And 7 over 14, well, that's just a fraction. I can reduce it. 7 over 14 is 1 half. So x equals 1 half. Well, let's see if this is a true statement. If we go back to the original equation here, and I plug in 1 half here, half of negative 10, let me just write this value here, 
half of negative 10 is negative 5. Equals half of 4 is 2 minus 2. Well, 5 minus 5 is 0. 2 minus 2 is 0. 0 is equal to 0. That's a true statement. 0 is 0. So our solution of x equals 1 half is the correct value. I checked my work. I know that I am right because this is a true statement. All right, let's move on and look at some other strategies. When solving linear equations, which just means one variable, we might have fractions. And I know with a lot of students, fractions can be a little unnerving at times. But when, it be, when we're dealing with equations, we have these tools that say, you know what? If we have fractions, we can eliminate them from equations. And how we do that, if I have just a single fraction in a linear equation, I can eliminate it using that property of equality. Essentially, this is division by 10. Well, I can undo that by multiplying by 10. Because that property of anything divided by itself reduces to 1. This will reduce to 1. But I have to remember what I do to one side, I have to do to the other. Now, I could multiply 10 times this 4 to get 40, and then distribute it through here and get large numbers, 40a minus uh, 200. 200 is a huge number. So what I'm going to do is that division first. 10 divided by 10 is 1. 1 times anything is that value. So I can just rewrite the value. 10 times negative a. A negative times a positive is negative 10a. Now, I can say, well, I can get rid of these parentheses. And that's something I could have done in the first step before I did this. But either way, 4 times a, 4 times negative 5. And now I can start simplifying. I see a's on both sides. So well, we've been simplifying, but we can continue to do so. Negative 10 is less than negative 4. So I'm going to add 10 a's to both sides. Now I'm going to take it down here. So if I add 10 a's to both sides, I'm going to get 14 a's on this side minus that value of 20 equals negative 10 a plus 10 a. Well, this is 0. And in the other examples, we just crossed it out because it was 0. It was gone. But on the right side of the equal sign, we still have to have something there. Well, the value that's there is 0. We have 0 over here, 0 a's, or just 0. And now I can say, well, how do I undo this? Well, it's just subtraction. Undo it with addition. What I do to one side, I do to the other. And so negative 20 plus 20 is 0. But if I add 0 to anything, it doesn't change it. It's that identity property of 0. Maybe we remember that. Now I can say, you know what? I have multiplication. Undo it with division. 14 over 14 is 1. So 1a equals 20 over 14. Well, we've got to reduce that. That's a fraction. So 20 and 14 have a common factor of 2. So if I divide by 2, I get 10. If I divide this by 2, I get 7. Now, even though it's an improper fraction, we can leave our answer like that. a equals 10 sevenths. I can plug that back in and check my work. But for time's sake, I'll leave that for you to try. All right, what if we have more than just one fraction? In this example, there was just one denominator. Well, here we have a 5 and a 3, a tool we can use to eliminate those fractions so that maybe we don't see a fraction until we get to the end is to use the least common denominator. Well, what is the least common denominator of 5 and 3? Well, 15. They're both prime numbers, so I'd have to multiply them together. 15 is my LCD. If I multiply both sides by 15, we'll see something interesting happen. Well, because this is a sum or difference, I have to use the distributive property. 15 times this quantity. Well, just like I did there, I did the division first. 15 divided by 5 is 3 times z. 15 times negative 2, because we're distributing, gives me negative 30. Here, I could say 15 times z divided by 3 and then reduce it. But I can do that right now. 15 over 3 is 5. 
times z. And now, it's just like the last problem. We're ready to get our z's together. So I see 3 is less than 5. That's the one that I want to take away from one side. What I do to one side, I do to the other. So I have negative 30 equals 2z. And I identify multiplication, undo it using division. So this becomes 1z, and I'll write it right here, equals negative 30 over 2 is negative 15. Now, notice what I did there. Even though the z was on the right side, I just wrote it on the left. So z equals negative 15 is the same thing as negative 15 equals z. So if I continued it down this way, if I had more board space, we would see I'd get negative 15 equals z. So the order doesn't matter. So don't, don't uh, fret too much when your z's or your variables on the right side instead of the left like we're accustomed to. So we've seen that the least common denominator worked. To get us the answer, we could plug it back in, simplify, and see if it's a true statement. Negative 15 over 5 is negative 3. Negative 3 minus 2 is negative 5. Here, if I put negative 15 in here, negative 15 over 3 is negative 5. So we get negative 5 equals negative 5. That's a true statement. I know this is correct. I checked my work. Now, we could use that exact same method right here. I see two fractions. And so I'd say, well, the least common denominator would be 20. I could multiply this side by 20 and this side by 20. And if I do that division, what will essentially happen is I'll get 5 times the top equals 4 times the top after I reduce it. Well, this is called a proportion. And proportions have a special tool we can use called the cross product. Essentially, multiply. The denominator of one side times the numerator of the other, and the denominator of this side to the numerator of that side. So I'd get 5 times x plus 2, 5 times that value, equals 4 times this value. And now I can eliminate parentheses using distributive property. And I can say, all right, let's get our x's together, because they're in two places. So it's 4 is smaller than 5, so I'm going to take it away from this side, take it away from that side. I get x plus 10 equals negative 4, because 4x minus 4x is 0. And I can say, OK, I've got to subtract 10 to undo that math. And we get x equals negative 4 and negative 10 is negative 14, same sign combined. So x equals negative 14. I can check that. Negative 14 plus 2 is negative 12. Negative 12 over 4 is negative 3. Negative 14 minus 1 is negative 15. Negative 15 divided by 5 is negative 3, a true statement. Negative 3 equals negative 3. Always check your work. Now, sometimes we deal with application problems. So here's an application problem. Let's say you're traveling overseas. And uh, being that every other country uh, uses the metric system, or temperatures in Celsius, and we're, maybe we're not familiar with that. So we're told that it's 28 degrees Celsius. And if we're not familiar with the Celsius scale, because we know the Fahrenheit scale, we might say, hey, 28 degrees, that sounds pretty cold. Because I know if it was 28 degrees in Fahrenheit, it'd be pretty cold. It'd be below freezing. I'd better get a coat on. So we have to do a conversion. We have to understand, well, how much is this in the scale that I'm familiar with? So we can use this formula. And this is to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. So let's think, what do we know? I know 28 degrees Celsius. The C represents. 28, so I'm going to put in 28 for the C value. And now I can solve this as a linear equation, one variable. So just like I did before, I can use distributive property. 5 ninths times f is 5 ninths f. And 5 ninths times negative 32, well, I could always think of any whole number as being over 1. Multiply the numerators. Negative. 5 times 32 is going to be 160. And 9 times 1 is 9. Now, 
to undo this math, I have to add 169 to both sides. Now, that's a fraction. I could eliminate that fraction right now. So I don't have to deal with it. I can say, you know what? Let's multiply by 9. That would be my common denominator. So if I multiply this by 9, I'm going to get 152 equals multiply this by 9. Wait, actually, let me write it in here. If I multiply this by 9, they would reduce. I get 5f. And if I multiply this by 9, because I have to distribute because of those parentheses, the 9's would reduce. And now I can solve this equation. Oh, 252. Sorry about that. Forgot to carry my 1, right? All right, so now I'm going to add 160 to undo this math. And when I do that, I get 400. And 12 equals 5f, because that reduces. And I identify multiplication, so I can do the division. So I have one f here. And it is equal to, well, we've got to do this division. 5 goes into 412. Well, I can say 5 goes into 48 times with a remainder of 1. So I'd carry that 1. 5 goes into 12 twice. With a remainder of 2, well, I could leave it as 2 over 5, so 82 and 2 fifths degrees. Or I could continue that using a decimal. So maybe I add this and say that remainder of 2 would be 20. With that new 0, 5 goes into 24 times, so it would be 0. 0.4. 82.4 degrees. Well, it's a good thing I did this conversion. If I was thinking 28 degrees was cold and it's actually 82.4 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm going to the beach instead. So <clears throat> that's uh, how we work with equations. And sometimes the numbers can be intimidating. They get relatively large. So let's look at a couple more strategies here and a few uh, situations that we might come across. What if we have decimals? Well, in our decimal system, they're factors of 10. This is the tenths place. This is the tenths. This is the hundredths. This is the tenths. Well, we can think of those in terms just like we did with fractions to have a common denominator. Well, what is the place value? Well, what's the smallest place value? Hundreds. So I can multiply this equation by 100. What I do to one side, I do to the other. And we'll watch something pretty interesting happen. If I multiply 100 times this value, I just move the decimal each factor of 10. Two factors of 10 is 100. So I'm going to move this two spots, 1, 2, which would give me 50 times x minus 2. 100 times this value, move the decimal two spots, I get 25. Multiply this by 100, move the decimal two spots, and I get 10x. Now we notice no more decimals. By multiplying by the smallest place value, the hundredths, I eliminated all the decimals. So now I can go ahead and solve this 50 times x, 50 times negative 2. We're using the distributive property to eliminate the parentheses. And now I can say, well, combining like terms, 50x and 25x is 75x. And I still have to get my x's together. So I'm going to take it away from this side. And I've got to remember, there still has to be something over there. And what I do to one side, I have to do to the other. 75x minus 10x is going to give me 65x. And now I can undo this subtraction. Add 100 to both sides. And now we can do the division. So divide both sides by 65. And I'm going to write it over here, x equals. 100 over 65, maybe we just reduce that. Or we actually do the division to get a decimal equivalent. 100 over 65 is going to reduce to, let's see, 20 thirteenths. And maybe if we wanted a decimal, maybe uh, our instructor or something in the homework says, write your answer as a decimal. Maybe it'll say, write your answer as a fraction. So you could actually do that division to get a decimal. Uh, you'd have to actually round this at some point. So we'll leave it in an exact form, 2013s. But we could check our work 
But again, for time's sake, this one is a little bit more uh, time consuming to check that value. All right, let's look at this one here. Sometimes it's possible to not have a solution. There's sometimes where we'll go to solve an equation, and there is no value for the variable that will ever make a statement true. Well, let's see. This is actually going to be one of those examples, but let's just do what we normally would do. Let's simplify. I can distribute to get rid of parentheses, and I remember to distribute it to each value. And then I see, OK, well, I have x's on both sides of the equal sign. Maybe I can uh, move one of them. And I say, well, 3 and 3 are the same value. And that should be a sign right away. But if we don't recognize that, we can say, well, it doesn't matter which one I move. So I'll just move them to the left side. So I'm going to subtract 3x from this side. And what I do to one side, I do to the other. 3x minus 3x is 0x. 0x is nothing. So nothing plus 3 is just 3. Here, 3x minus 3x again is 0. 0 plus 5 is just 5. This is the telltale sign that there is no solution that will ever make that true. It, it says 3 equals to 5. That is never a true statement. 3 is never equal to 5. 3 and 5 are totally different numbers. This is not a true statement, which tells me there is no value of x that will ever make 3 equal to 5. So we actually write out no solution. Or if you're one of the cool math kids, you can use this symbol, which is the null set. It's not a 0. It means null set. It's a symbol that means no solution. All right, <clears throat> let's look at this example here. Sometimes we'll find equations that have infinite solutions that basically means no matter what value we put in for that variable, it's always a true statement. So let's see what happens here. Let's use our tools that we've been looking at. We're going to distribute 2x plus 20 minus 10 equals 2x plus 10. And if I simplify 20 minus 10, because they're just numbers, and I'm going to stop right here for a moment. And draw your attention to this. And this is something to look for when solving equations. If this side, 2x plus 10, equals 2x plus 10, they say the same thing on both sides. It is what it is. This is a true statement. And no matter what value we put in for x. So if I put in a value here, multiply by 2 and add 10, that same value would have to go in here, multiply by 2 and add 10. I'm doing the same operations, that property of equality. So what if I didn't recognize these to be an identity statement? This is that. I could subtract 2x from this side and this side, just like I did here. And we'll see, well, that's 0. So I get 10. And this is 0 plus 10 is 10. 10 equals 10. That's a true statement. And the x's went away, which tells me no matter what x is, 10 will always be equal to 10. This is a true statement. So, what this tells me is the answer is all real numbers. I could write out all real numbers, or I could use this symbol, which means all real numbers, or I can use interval notation, which we will definitely delve into deeper as this course goes on. So we could use this symbol, or we can use this. Okay? And this is negative infinity to infinity. That means all the real numbers. Any value will make that true. All right, we're going to look at one more example. And sometimes we're looking at applications. So we have to recall how to translate English phrases into algebraic expressions. So it says the sum of 4 times a number in negative 2 is equal to the sum of 5 times the same number and negative 2. Find the number. So I'm going to reassess and say, well, it's telling me a sum of 4 times a number times, I know what operation that is, so sum is adding and times is multiplying, is equal, that's an important statement, to the sum of 5 times the same number and negative 2. So I've assessed it, and I know what operations I'm going to have here. The sum of 4 times a number. Well, I don't know what that number is. 
So I'll assign a variable. I'm going to use x. You could use any, any letter or symbol that you would want to use. So the sum of 4 times a number and negative 2. Well, add tells me that sum, this value, 4 times a number and negative 2 is equal. There's my equal sign. And it says the sum of 5 times a number. So 5 times a number and negative 2. 5 times the same numbers. And that's why this is important. Same number, same variable that I used here, I have to use here. And now that we've translated it, we're ready to solve it. So if I subtract 4x from both sides, because this is smaller than that, I get 1x minus 2. And I'm just simplifying. Adding a negative is the same thing as subtraction. Here, I have 0 and negative 2, which is just negative 2. And now I see, OK, I have a negative 2 on both sides. Do not skip any steps. Don't assume that it might be this case or that case. Actually, continue through and simplify it. I'm going to add 2 to both sides to undo that subtraction. And negative 2 plus 2 is 0. And x negative 2 plus 2 is 0. x and 0 is just x. We find that x is equal to 0. Sometimes this can be a hurdle because we have to remember 0 is a number just like any other. It can be the solution. So let's take that value and plug it back in. 0 plus negative 2 is 0 plus negative 2. Negative 2 is negative 2. That is a true statement. All right, let's go over here. And I'll just clear this stuff out of the way so it doesn't distract us from what we're looking at. I want you to try these examples on your own. And remember, at any time, you can always go back through the video and see the similar example, how it was worked through. Try this one for yourself. And remember, check your work. Also, try this one. The key to this one, notice it's a fraction equal to a fraction. We did one very similar to that. This one has some decimals. Maybe we want to eliminate those decimals. Here we have some simplifying and combining to do. And this one here, there's a hint to this one. Two ways to look at it. I can say, well, I have multiplication by 4 fifths. Or I could break it down. I can say it's multiplied by 4 divided by 5. So I could say, let's undo that division and multiply by 5. And let's do, undo this uh, multiplication and divide by 4. Well, essentially, the key to this one is multiply by the reciprocal. Because the 4 will reduce to 1, the 5 will reduce to 1. And what you do to one side, you do to the other. So that's your hint for this one. Give it a try. Thank you for watching.